Thank you, LifePoint. It's a privilege to have this opportunity to be with you in this moment, Haley and I, and it's a joy to have Haley with me. She doesn't always get to travel with me. Our kids are getting older, and uh, they're all grown. My last one leaves the house to go to college in a few weeks, and uh, so it's a privilege to have her get to travel with me today. We consider uh, Mike and Stephanie uh, to be some of the most choice servants of God. You are blessed as a people. This community is blessed that they've given their lives to serve it, to serve you. And I just want to say, say I, I pastor a great church, but um, one of the passions of my life is what we do at Lonesome Dove Ranch. Haley and I co-founded the ranch. I'm a, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. My dad left when I was young, left me vulnerable. Uh, pervert stepped in, unknown to my family. Uh, I was raped, uh, ravaged for a number of years in my young life. It affected me. I became an addict to drown out the pain of abandonment and abuse. And um, I came to Jesus, had a radical conversion, delivered me. And as God began to redeem my pain, I not only wanted to help addicts that I had, like I had become, I wanted to help restore broken hearts. And I started traveling as a youth evangelist and uh, would give an altar call in a room of a thousand teenage kids. To, I, I felt led to share my story after many years of traveling. And the first time I did, 300 kids in a room of 1,000 responded, and I'm like, I know there are more. And I'm like, God, I gotta do more than have one night a week with these kids. And it was when the dream was born, why not have an entire camp for kids that have been through what I've been through? And so that's when the dream was born over 25 years ago. Haley and I married. Uh, she, her family was a foster family, took kids out of the system. So she came at it from that side. I came at it from the, the victim side. And uh, she was a rodeo family. I come from a farm family. So we wanted to combine the outdoors, um, farm life with the gospel and uh, bring healing to brokenhearted children. And so about 12 years ago, we started running camps for these kids with the worst abuse cases uh, in the system are entrusted into our care. And uh, I'm talking about seven-year-old girls that have been used in sex trafficking and left in a hotel room like throwaway laundry, found by the hotel staff, and then they're entrusted into our care. And then uh, it made national news a few years ago out of Denton, several kids were found in dog kennels in a barn, been left in there for years. Uh, obviously, they were developmentally far behind and a lot of other scars. We were able to work with those kids, get them placed in homes, and uh, recently got to see them be adopted in forever families in a Christian home. It is the greatest joy of my life to be able to walk out what we do at Lonesome Dove Ranch, take these kids on a journey. Uh, the charity that runs the ranch is very separate from my church because when I retire from the church, this is the passion of my life and I don't want to have to leave it. And so it's separate, but because I pastor, it bleeds over and the people serve there um, and it's gotten in the heart of our people and they start adopting these kids. So one of the greatest joys of my life is when I go to church, walk in the lobby, one of the kids that came out of trauma into the ranch has been adopted into a forever family in my church. Now they're running the halls of our children's ministry. That's the gospel to me. That's the gospel. Every month, Lonesome Dove Ranch gets a check from your missions fund here at LifePoint, and you're investing in the plight of the orphan, and when you are, you're capturing the heart of God. That's his heart, and I just want to say thank you as a church family for your generosity. You're actually sending, last year you sent a team, you're sending two, coming to at least two of the weeks this year, uh, and Christian, who's kind of heading that up, said you may send more, depending on interest today. Out in the lobby today, they at the missions banner, there's not a Lonesome Dove banner, but a missions banner. Um, go to the missions banner and there's a team from LifePoint that will talk to you about how to get to an informational meeting. We, we send our trainers here. They will train you, get you ready, um, and you can show up in June uh, and we can change the world one broken heart at a time. So thank you, thank you, thank you, church. I want you to turn with me today to Genesis 15. Uh, hold your place there. I am not a uh, coming today as the founder and director of Lonesome Dove Ranch. I'm functioning today uh, as a pastor, and I have a word from a pastor's heart today. As I prayed for our time together, I had this strong sense that I was supposed to preach to a specific somebody. And the best way I know how to describe that person is to use the imagery of a battle or a fight. And it feels like life is pummeling you right now. You're beaten down and exhausted. As a child of God, you know what the Bible says about you. You know it says you're an overcomer, more than a conqueror, a child of the king. You're the first and not the last, the head and not the tail. You know that. According to the book, you're an odds-on favorite to win this fight. But life keeps throwing these bruising blows, one barrage of blows after another. 
and your faith is weakening. You're starting to believe that you can't win this thing. There's a spiritual war raging in you and around you and it's taking its toll. There's an attack on your marriage or the kids or the money or your health or the failing business or your sobriety that's slipping or the crushed dreams that you're staring at. Whatever it may be, it has you staggering around in the center of the ring, grasping for the ropes, just trying to stay on your feet. You're doing everything you can to simply not quit. I believe God sent me to Clarksville to talk to you today and to address the two biggest questions in your heart. Now, you may not have put these words to it, but on one level, you're doubting and questioning yourself. You don't know if you have what it takes. But on an even more concerning level, you're starting to question God. If he really cared, if he was really there, how could he be sitting back allowing you to get pummeled in life the way you are? And I believe God assigned me to your corner today in your fight. He put me in your corner to look into your tired eyes and remind you that things are not as they appear. You are not fighting alone. And if you can muster up enough courage and faith to face the next round of this fight, God is promising you today that he will make himself more real, tangible, and visible in your battle than he ever has before. He wants me to remind you of his promises, the things that initially gave you hope, the things that initially built your faith, that no matter how things appear right now, what the Bible says about you is true. You are an overcomer, you are more than a conqueror, and you will win because he is a promise keeper and this battle belongs to him. And I want to illustrate what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is trying to say to you today with a passage in Genesis 15. Abraham finds himself in Genesis 15 in a place just like you find yourself today. He's in the fight of his life. And in this particular moment, he's discouraged. He had given up on himself and given up on God and God's promises. You have to remember that God had given Abraham a promise that shaped Abraham's life and all of ours. When Abraham was old and childless, God promised Abraham that he would have a son. And through that son, he would have descendants that would number the stars in the sky. And through those descendants, God's promise was all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Now, we all know Jesus came from Abraham, and that's how God kept the promise that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. That's how that promise to Abraham impacts all of us. As we approach Genesis 15, a lot of years have passed since God made that promise to Abraham. Abraham is exhausted with the waiting, no fulfillment in the promise. He's exhausted with life. He's questioning everything he's ever believed about himself and everything he's ever believed about God. Genesis 15 holds incredible significance in Old Testament history. But when we read it, the meat of it is in the very beginning and at the end. And so we kind of skim past verse 11 as if it's an insignificant detail. But I believe what Abraham is doing in verse 11 is what we need to be doing today. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. I titled the message today, Drive Them Birds Away. And listen, I have an earned doctorate. I know that's not proper English, okay? I'm educated enough, but I'm also from the farm in East Arkansas. And when we got excited and said something, usually it didn't come out passionate with proper English. It would have sounded more like, we wouldn't have said drive the birds away. We would have said drive them birds away. And that's the way I feel it today. So that's the way I'm going to say it. To understand the significance of what Abraham is doing in verse 11, you got to understand the context of the whole chapter. So verse 1 says this, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram. So when a chapter begins with the words, after this, you know that we're picking up in the middle of something. So the previous chapter, chapter 14, tribal chiefs and warlords are plundering the area where Abraham lives and they enslave, they kidnap and enslave a bunch of Abraham's family. Abraham gathers an army to go pursue them. He's able to overtake them and get his family back. But the incident became the final blow to Abraham's weakening faith. He's at a very low point in his walk with God, and God knows that. So God appears on the scene and says, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. He's promising to reward Abraham and protect him. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. 
So God offers this promise of being his rewarder and his protector, and Abraham says, yeah, about that reward thing. You told me that all the families of the earth were gonna be blessed through me, but what good are all of your blessings and promises if I don't have a son? How is all that supposed to happen if I am childless? As it stands now, my servant is gonna inherit all I have. This is a very real expression of doubt from a man that we have all long held up as a model of faith and trust. And at the heart of it, what Abraham is really doing here, he's questioning God. He's saying, can I really trust you? Can I really count on you? Do you really keep your promises? Now, I I want you to pay attention to how God responds to Abraham's doubting and questioning because the way he responds to Abraham is the same way he's gonna respond to you in your questioning and your doubting. Verse five, then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. This is a very gracious and compassionate moment where God is being very fatherly. And it's almost like he slips his arm around his young son, takes him outside and says, look up, son. Can you count the stars? No, you can't. I promise you. He renews the promise that your descendants will do exactly like I said, they will number the stars in the sky. And we know this moment impacted Abraham deeply because the next verse says, and Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So God addresses Abraham's doubt, it obviously encourages him. And it seems like at least at some level, Abraham's faith has been restored. This should be the end of the story, period, but it's not because Abraham's just like me, he's just like you. His faith and trust was often fickle, just like ours. In verse seven, God restates the promise to Abraham, not only that he's gonna give him a son, but he said, I'm gonna give you land too. I'm gonna give you enough land for all of your descendants to dwell. But in verse number eight, Abraham doubts again. But Abraham replied, "O sovereign Lord, how can I be sure I will actually possess it. That's the cry of a doubting heart. He's still questioning, how can I know for sure? But there's a difference in this expression of doubt in verse eight than the one back in verse two. The first question was a question, he was questioning God's character. But now he's questioning his own character. He's doubting himself. In verse two, when Abraham asked God if he was gonna keep his word and give him a son, he was saying, can I trust you? Can I count on you? In the second question in verse eight, Abraham is saying, how can I be sure? Literally it says, how can I be sure I will possess it? He's questioning himself. Because once you've settled the God questions and realize he's there and he's trustworthy, you move to the next layer of doubt. Okay, I know God can be trusted, I trust him, but I'm not sure I can be what I need to be. I don't know that I have the strength to wait on that promise. I'm not sure if I can be the man or woman to see this thing through. And what happens next is one of the most incredible pictures of grace in the entire Bible. I want you to see how God responds to both layers of Abraham's doubt. Abraham's doubt of God and Abraham's doubt of himself. But in order for us to fully grasp it, We're going to have to dig a little deeper into Abraham's culture because there's some cultural implications to Genesis 15. Abraham says, how can I be sure? In the very next verse, this is the response from God. Verse 9, the Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abraham presented all of these to him. Now it's obvious in what's going on here, the way they're interacting with each other, that Abraham knows exactly what God is asking for and why. There is no explanation from God. There is no questioning from Abraham. Abraham does exactly what God's asking, as if the both of them know exactly what's going on. But we don't, because we don't understand the culture. God was offering to enter a covenant with, a, enter into a covenant with Abraham, and Abraham understands exactly when God starts asking, this is covenant language, God is about to do something, so he immediately is obedient to what God asked. They all both understand it, we don't. Our culture is a written culture. We would settle issues with written contracts. We legally bind ourselves to keep our end of an obligation or a promise with the contract. If we don't, The penalty for failing to keep the promise is spelled out in the contract. It says, here's what I promise to do, here's the penalty if I don't. So when a salesperson says to you, you get this much car or this much house or this much whatever for this amount of money, we say, how can I know? 
How can I be sure? That's where the contract comes in. It's a legally binding agreement that demands both parties keep their word or penalties have to be paid. This is exactly what God is offering Abraham. But the culture was not a written culture, it was an oral culture. And legally binding agreements and oral cultures were not contracts, they were covenants. And the way you came into a legally binding agreement in an oral culture is to dramatize or ritually act out the consequence of you not keeping your end of the agreement or the covenant. And we know from history and archaeology, the way legally binding agreements were made in ancient Near Eastern cultures was this. Animals were literally cut in half, one piece of the animal, one half on this side, one half laid on this side, and they were lined up on both sides. And the two parties entering into the agreement would walk in between the pieces, and that was the essence of signing the contract. Both parties were ritually acting out their responsibility, fulfill their promise, and agreeing at the same time, what they were really doing was agreeing to the consequences of the penalty if they failed to keep their word. They were saying, if I don't fail to keep, if I fail to keep my word, my fate will be the same as the fate of these animals. I will be cut off. You actually see a reference to that in another place in the Bible. In the book of Jeremiah 34, verse 18, it says, because you have broken the terms of our covenant, I will cut you apart just as you cut apart the calf when you walked between its halves to solemnize your vows. In other words, you made an agreement and because you didn't keep your agreement, your penalty will be the same as it was for the calf. This is exactly what is happening in Genesis 15. God is addressing Abraham's exhaustion with life, his doubting and his questioning by renewing the covenant with him. And I want you to know, I want you to see what happens. Verse 17, after the sun went down, darkness fell. Abraham saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abraham that day. Now the reference to smoking fire pot and flaming torch in the Hebrew language are the exact same Hebrew words as fire and cloud that descended on Moses on Mount Sinai when he got the Ten Commandments. It's the same exact two Hebrew words when it references the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night that led the children of Israel in the wilderness. So this is an undeniable, unmistakable reference to the fact that God is the one that walked between the pieces. This is remarkable on many fronts. From what we know historically about these agreements in the ancient world, kings and authority figures never walked between the pieces. The kings would have these pieces lined up and have their servants or their people walk between the pieces to vow their loyalty to the king, but the ones in authority never walked between the pieces, but God did. And the moment here is even more remarkable because when God graciously walks between the pieces to enter a covenant with Abraham, it is now supposed to be Abraham's turn. Both parties are supposed to walk between the pieces. Abraham has to sign his name on the contract. But immediately when God passes through, verse 18 says, so the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day. Wait, time out. You can't have a contract if both parties don't sign. What, what's happening here? Why didn't Abraham get his turn? Well, you have to understand, anytime God steps into a human cultural form, he changes it. Nowhere in history does it ever happen like this, where only the king or authority figure will pass through and sign the contract. But in doing it this way, God is addressing both layers of Abraham's doubt. He is promising that he will be the God of promise, and he is promising to make up for Abraham's weakness and failure. He's saying, Abraham, you can trust me. If I don't fulfill my word, may I be cut off. And then by finalizing the covenant before Abraham even had a chance to walk through, he's addressing Abraham's doubts about himself. He's saying, Abraham, my faithfulness to you is greater than your failure before me. My promise is greater than your doubts. My grace is greater than your sin. Your future and this promise does not hinge on your weakness, but on my strength. If I fail, I'll pay the penalty. If you fail, I'll pay the penalty. I will absorb the cost for your failure. I make myself accountable to pay for your weakness, your sin, your failure. It's a one-sided covenant and it is unbelievable. Never before had it ever happened anywhere in history. And some of you might be saying, man, 
Pastor, I'm so tired right now. I just wish God would come down in human form and cut a covenant with me like that to address all of my doubts and all of my questions. Oh, but don't you get it? He did. In the same way darkness fell on Abraham that day, 2,000 years ago at Calvary, darkness covered Jerusalem in the middle of the day, and the Father offered a spotless lamb to cut a covenant with you. The blood of Jesus was shed to address your doubting, questioning, and failing, and in doing so, God was promising to keep his covenant with you. He was saying to you, if I fail, I'll pay the penalty. If you fail, I'll pay the penalty. I make myself accountable for your failure. You can put your trust in a God like that. Amen. All right, now that you understand, okay, what all is going on, okay, you have a, an understand, clear understanding of what's happening in Genesis 15, I need you to get your head and heart around verse 11. Most of the time it's just insignificant detail, but I believe this is what the Lord wants branded on our hearts today. Abraham's pummeled by life, disheartened, full of questions and doubts, but tired and weary, he's obedient and gets the animals ready for the covenant ceremony. When he finishes and has it all lined up, he's waiting, just waiting on God to do his part. He doesn't know what's about to happen, but he notices vultures and buzzards and other birds of prey sweeping down to steal his sacrifice, and the ravens, they land on the sacrifice and start pulling the meat off the bones. Abraham is fully aware of what's at stake here. He's tired and exhausted, but he refuses to let these enemies rob him of anything else. So with the little bit of faith and energy he has left, the Bible says in verse 11, the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. Now, I don't know exactly what he had in his hand. I don't know how long it fought he had to fight them off, but Abraham knew he was on the verge of an encounter with God that was going to shape the destiny of his life, and he wasn't about to let these scavengers and plunderers rip the meat off the bones of his promise. They were trying to steal his sacrifice, but Abraham drove the birds away. Now, I think they have a a little prop for me to use today because I don't know how you see it, but it probably plays out a little different, thank you, a little different in my head than maybe it really happened or the way it would play out in your head. We've all seen the dramas more than likely. Abraham probably had a staff in his hand that would be more culturally appropriate, but it just happens a little different for me. I grew up on a farm in East Arkansas and my my family would rather me use the word humble than poor, but we were both. And... um, (laughs) I was running around on the farm. I lived with my grandparents because of some family dysfunction. And I was five, six, seven years old in that area, no shirt, uh, cut off pair of blue jeans, no, sh- no socks or shoes, running around in the yard. My grandma was putting clothes. We had a clothesline outside, and this was a daily habit. She had a homemade little uh, bag she had made to keep all of her wooden clothespins and her clothes basket, and she hung them out on the line, and she was working on that. I was running around playing in the yard. We had a chicken coop as well, and the chickens got out every morning. They went back and roosted at night. Uh, me and the chickens, we, we didn't get along. I, I didn't like the chickens. They didn't like me. I deserved all the hate. I threw firecrackers in their pen. I threw mud balls at them, shot them with BB guns. I did everything. I was just horribly mean to the chickens. The rooster did not like me, all right, he, because of that. He, and it was deserved hate. I deserved everything I got. But I wasn't bothering them that day, all right? I'm minding my business. They're scratching in the yard, minding their business. And I'm just walking along. A rooster, land, the rooster that hated my guts, landed on my bare back, dug his claws into my skin, and started pecking on the back of my head. I just took off running through the yard, screaming, blood's running down my back. I see the wings on the rooster waving behind me as he tries to stay dug into my back. So I, I didn't know anything to do but run towards my grandma. I run straight towards her screaming, and I went right past her, right under the clothesline, right past her. There must have been a broom, okay, somewhere around leaning up against the house or the post of the clothespin. All I know is that I look around behind me. My grandma is chasing me and the chicken with the broom, and she's swatting like a major league baseball player trying to swat that chicken off my back. Eventually she connects and that chicken goes rolling across the yard and before it can get to its feet, my grandma has picked it up. And those of you from the farm, you know what's about to happen. In one yank, she pops that rooster and holds its head in her hand and my life was marked forever after this moment. I was scarred. (laughs) That bloody blob of a rooster took off running. It flew without a head. It flew and ran and flew 
flew and it ran all over the earth. I looked at the rooster. I looked back at my grandma. I couldn't believe what I was saying. But nobody ever had to explain to me the phrase running around like a chicken with its head cut off. The chicken was more active without a head than it was before. And there's a sermon there I don't have time to preach. Revelation 12 says the devil is active because he knows his time is short. He is active in this world in your life because he's running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Listen, there is a real devil that has a real plan to destroy your life. And if life has beaten you down in this long fight and the spiritual enemy is scavenging on your marriage or your kids or your money or your health or your business or your sobriety or your dreams, you cannot sit idly by and just act like that that's his right and let the vultures come and pick the meat off your promise. Something needs to rise up in somebody in this room and start declaring, I will drive those birds away. Some daddy, some mama, some teenager, some grandparent, everything about your future hinges on the covenant promise from God in your life and you've gotta drive them birds away. But you say, Pastor, how do you do that? I'm too tired, I'm, I'm too exhausted, I'm too defeated. It was all I could do to get to church this morning and I came in questioning God and questioning myself. But the enemy's trying to steal your promise. The scavengers are pulling the meat off your miracle. If that's you, let me just quickly here show you how to drive the birds away. Look at what the book of Acts says about Jesus. Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power to break the chains of the enemy off of your life. So if Jesus is the one anointed to break the chains and the power of the devil, then use his name, use his word, and use his cross to drive the birds away. His name, Jesus is the name above all names. The enemy does not respond to churchgoers. He isn't defeated by those that pray the loudest or those who say the most articulate prayers. Satan is bound by and understands authority. So think about it in military terms. And if there's any room that ought to understand it, it ought to be this one. A private, let's say a private comes along and gives an order to a captain. The captain is going to laugh in the private's face. But if the general comes along and gives that same order to the captain, the captain is going to say, yes, sir. Because the captain understands and responds differently in each situation because he or she understands the chain of command. It is about authority. The Bible tells us Satan understands and is bound by the chain of command. He responds to authority, which means when you're confronting the enemy in a situation in your life, even though you may feel like a low-ranking private in the army of God, when the enemy attacks, don't respond to him in your authority. Come in the general's name. I got three kids a 24-year-old son, a 22-year-old son, and an 18-year-old daughter. And she thinks she can whip both of them. And you can just imagine when we were younger, they were younger, and I needed the boys, I would send Addie, go, go tell your brothers to come here. She would come back and she would say, Daddy, they won't come. I said, because you acted like you wanted them to come. They're not gonna listen to you. Go tell them I said come. And when she went and said, Daddy said come, they came because she decided to stop showing up in the power of her own name and come in the authority of someone else. And that's what happens when you stand in the authority of the name of Jesus. Philippians 2 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That is everywhere. That means they bow to Jesus in heaven, they bow to Jesus on earth, and they bow to Jesus in hell. They all bow to the name. So stand in the power of the name. Drive the birds away from your promise with the authority of the name of Jesus. His word. The Bible cannot be just your devotional book that you cozy up by the fire with some milk and cookies. Okay, It is a devotional book, but it calls itself a weapon. The Bible calls itself a sword, which means you have to see it differently and you have to use it differently. Every time you face something, find a verse and use it as a weapon against the attack of the enemy in your life. 
which is why mem memorizing scripture is so important because you can pull out a sword and use it at a moment's notice. If the enemy is coming at you with crippling fear, pull out the sword of Psalm 27 that says, the Lord is my salvation, whom shall I be afraid? If the enemy is attacking your finances, coming after the resources in your life, come at him with the sword of Psalm 37 that says, I was young, uh, young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Or you want a New Testament sword? My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. There is a verse for every situation. Use your Bible differently. See your Bible differently. Drive the birds away. The cross. The cross is the place of the enemy's ultimate defeat. And when you remind him, when, when you're in the heat of the battle, point the enemy back to the cross. And when you remind him of his ultimate defeat, it builds confidence in you because you're pointing yourself to your ultimate victory. And the reason this was the enemy's ultimate defeat and your ultimate victory, it's, be, it's where Jesus gave his lifeblood to seal the covenant with you. Revelation 12 says they overcame, they, us, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony with the power and the authority in the cross through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ drive the birds away from your promises too many of us view prayer as this passive quiet, sweet contemplative little thing and prayer can be all those things but prayer is far more than just communion with God there are moments in your life when the birds of prey come down to steal your promise. The battle is gonna call you to declarative prayer, declarations of prayer, confrontational prayer that rebuke the power of the enemy in your life. There comes a moment when you have to declare over your family in the name of Jesus, devil, you will not have your way with my kids. You will not have your way with my marriage. You will not have your way in my health or in my finances. I stand on the covenant promise of God. Drive the birds away. Look. It's not dignified, it's not appropriate decorum, but when those orphan kids show up from their horrible, hellish, demonic situations they've come through, while they're at camp, I'm so bothered by what I see in their case files, sometimes I go to the back side of the ranch so nobody misinterprets, but if they did, it would be like Eli misinterpreting Hannah's desperate prayer in the temple and I will pace on the backside of that pasture. I'll raise my voice. I will yell and declare prayer. God, you, you created them before they were ever put in their mother's womb. You produced them before you formed them and you wrote all the days of their life in a book. You destined them for greatness. There are promises over their life. You cannot let some perverted individual or devilish plan rob them and I literally try to drive the birds away. You need to do that over your own life today. So stand with me, if you will, across this place. We're gonna do that this morning. I want you by faith, you know what you're waiting on today. You know what's going on in your health, the diagnosis, what's going on with your prodigal kids. You know what's happening in the financial picture. There are other promises right now that are things that are happening in your family. You know what they are. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. It's time to drive them birds away, Father. I just pause for a moment and I ask you, I believe this is a God moment, a God word for somebody. And if it's not relevant to everybody, it will be at some point in their future. And I just ask you in the mighty name of Jesus, through the authority of the written word and the power of the cross, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, would you begin to lift a standard against the attack over these people's lives? I pray for deliverance and salvation and healing and supernatural provision. Would you make the crooked road straight? Would you make a highway in the wilderness, God? Would you make a way where there seems to be no way? Show yourself faithful in these lives today. Cut a covenant with them today, Lord. Renew the promise and impart faith and hope in their lives. In Jesus' name, if you believe he's doing that right now, would you give him an ovation of praise across this room? Come on, he's at work in this place today.